Now, what about the use of imaging? So as I said, we did use imaging fairly frequently in these patients. Um, it was sometimes a little bit of a battle. Those of you who are using imaging in your clinical practice know that more and more these days there's requests for pre-authorization, a lot of denials, a lot of requests for peer-to-peer. -peer. So this is somewhat of a challenge to get imaging studies incorporated. When we look at skeletal metastatic disease from prostate carcinoma, we actually have a number of uh, imaging agents that we can use, all the way from our standard Technetium 99M bone scan, which could be done either with planar imaging or with SPECT or SPECT-CT. Uh, we used a lot of F18 sodium fluoride PET-CT scanning. We felt that this was a, a better way of imaging these patients, and I'll show you some examples. We also had some experience in these patients using F18 FDG, which can show you the metabolism of the tumor itself. And then going forward, there are other imaging compounds that have shown a lot of promise in the field of prostate cancer imaging. Carbon-11 choline is FDA approved right now and being at a, uh, offered at a few places throughout the country. F18 fluorocholine is used fairly extensively in Europe. And then we have the newer generations of imaging compounds. There are things like uh, PSMA compounds, either with carbon-11 or more recently fluorine-18, as well as compounds like acetate, FACBC. There are other compounds that are out there that are also used to image prostate carcinoma. Now, once you get below uh, technetium 99 m MDP and F18 sodium fluoride on here, the advantage of the compounds at the lower end of this chart, uh, this graph, are that they're actually imaging the tumor. Whereas when you're doing bone imaging, you're looking at the secondary effects of tumor based on skeletal activity. Like I said, we really preferred uh, F18 sodium fluoride PET-CT. This is an example of a patient who was treated fairly early on at our institution at MD Anderson, where you can see a large metastasis in the iliac bone on the baseline examination. And then in follow-up, we see we've effectively treated that lesion in the iliac bone. There's a little bit of activity at the periphery, which could be some residual tumor. It could be some flare phenomenon. And then some smaller disease throughout the remainder of the skeleton that's developed in the interim. But the highlight of this is really how well this dominant lesion in the iliac bone has responded to radium therapy on fluoride imaging. And we can actually do these nice 3D reconstructions to see how well this lesion has decreased in intensity on follow-up after only three doses of radium. Now we look back at our experience and, and one thing that we did find that was very consistent uh, was that we could quantify the extent of disease on a fluoride bone scan and that actually had some prognostic value for evaluation of these patients. And so we published a few papers looking at the technique used where you can threshold the intensity of activity and actually come up with a quantitative metric for the burden of tumor in a particular patient. And where it's useful is when you're trying to assign numerical values to understand the extent of either progression or positive response in patients like this. So we have patient number one on the left-hand side and patient number two on the right-hand side. And your eye can, can tell you that it looks like patient number one, you know, maybe responding in certain locations, but in other locations, it looks like the disease is progressing. We certainly see much more rib activity on that right-hand follow-up image, some more activity in the proximal humeri. But the advantage of being able to be quantitative about this is that you can actually establish a numerical metric that will tell you exactly how much the disease has progressed in the interim. Contrast to with number, uh, patient number two on the right-hand side, where you can see this patient is experiencing a very positive response to radium therapy. This is after three doses in each of these cases. And we can see patient number two has, has responded very well. The lesions have decreased in intensity, and we really see no areas of progression. And so here's an example of two different patients, again, where we can assign these numerical values. And we, if we look at what we term the total fluoride index, TFI-10, um, on the column, on the uh, left-hand column, we can see that in patient number one, that has increased by 207%, whereas in patient number two on the right-hand side, that value has decreased by 84%, 83.9%. The volume of disease can also be quantified in this method, actually looking at the volume of involved skeleton. Now, where we found that this was helpful is in looking, again, at patient prognosis. So we looked at the correlation of the, progno of the total, total burden with prognosis, and this is just to sum it up. So here's an example of this extraction on the, on the left-hand side, that panel D, 
What you see in panel A is actually the overall survival data from the LSIMCA trial. So this was the data that was published in New England Journal with the overall survival curve. And when I highlight this in green, this will be the LSIMCA data on an unscreened patient population. This is what we found from our data when we applied the total skeletal tumor burden, is that we found that in patients with a low skeletal tumor burden, the solid line on the top, they had a better overall survival than the LSIMCA trial, whereas patients with a high skeletal tumor burden, the dotted line on the bottom, had a worse overall survival. So this is like many other studies that have been done using imaging in other scenarios in that you can actually evaluate patients up front and get an idea what their prognosis is based on a certain imaging biomarker, and in this case, the imaging biomarker is total skeletal tumor burden based on fluoride PET-CT. So we found this information helpful in understanding prognosis, but it does leave some gaps. So as we look at our overall understanding of radium-223, there are some things that we think we do know at this point. It's been shown in a prospective randomized trial that radium-223 administration does improve overall survival in patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate carcinoma compared to placebo. In retrospective analyses, some of which we have done at MD Anderson, we see that skeletal tumor burden using fluoride PET-CT seems to be a prognostic imaging biomarker, so it is correlated with overall survival in a prognostic fashion. There does seem to be a benefit with completing all six doses of radium-223, even in the setting of what looks like progression on radium, those patients still seem to benefit from, from continuing radium-223 therapy. There seems to be a possible benefit from concomitant treatment of, uh, with radium-223 and abiraterone, and perhaps an increased risk of bone marrow failure when patients are treated with radium-223 plus external beam radiation therapy. But there are many unanswered questions. So the interesting thing about looking back at experiences is that you can start to fill in some of the gaps, but it also raises some interesting questions. One of which is, is we don't really understand the true mechanism of radium-223. We, we know that it goes to the skeleton. We know that it, its uptake seems to mirror that of other bone-seeking radiopharmaceuticals, and we presume that the four-step alpha decay that's taking place is causing double-strand DNA strand breaks and cell death and leads to an overall improvement. But there is certainly a lot of work that would need to be done on a preclinical side to really understand what the actual mechanism is of radium-223. So an alternative hypothesis that's out there is that radium-223, in addition to some of the direct toxic effects of the radiation, uh, radioactive decay, is that it, maybe it's changing the bone marrow microenvironment, which is very important for sustaining and promoting tumor growth. And so it may be through the secondary mechanism that, that radium is also having a positive effect. We don't truly know the optimal dose and delivery. Radium was, is generally given at a 50 kilobecquerels per kilogram dosing at every month for six doses. And that was based on earlier trials looking at dose escalation and toxicity and things like that. But there are certainly some alternative doses that could be administered to patients. Um, it seems like some of the higher doses in the earlier publications, phase one and phase two trials, were also tolerated at a fairly reasonable level. And there's nothing to say that a monthly dose is perhaps the most optimal delivery. Now, an example of this is that data is, is just now being published looking at re treatment of patients who responded well to radium-223 in the first six doses, and it seems like it is going to be safe to select some of these patients for subsequent six doses of radium out to a total administered doses of, of 12 deliveries of radium-223. And so that's an example how we're doing studies to look at alternative ways and perhaps additional administration of radium-223 that may have a positive outcome. One big question right now is who is the ideal candidate and when should radium be administered? We have some alternatives, and when you look at the NCCN guidelines right now, radium is administered as or is on there as an acceptable therapy alongside docetaxel. But it doesn't really make any, any claim as to which is the better <clears throat> treatment in which particular patient. And so we have a lot to understand about the optimal timing of radium and when it should be administered. As we saw at MD Anderson, I think that we are oftentimes waiting a little bit too long, that you, you don't want to wait until patients necessarily have extensive disease, they've run out of other therapies, and, and radium is their last chance. Certainly, radium in that setting seems to be a good therapy, and the patients can have some positive effect in terms of treatment of their disease and in terms of their skeletal pain and symptoms. But 
maybe the ideal candidate is one with smaller volume disease and treating patients earlier in the course of bone metastatic disease and not waiting for the disease to get to that extensive of a level. That's the sort of thing that really needs to be determined going forward. And what is the optimal treatment? I've heard some very cogent arguments that docetaxel should be administered first and then radium-223 in those who fail docetaxel. And other equally compelling arguments to say that you should treat with radium-223 earlier And then once you've administered the radium-223, then use docetaxel in the follow-up. There are some interesting arguments on both sides of that equation. What is the need for imaging? So we did imaging fairly uh, frequently in our patient population at MD Anderson, but others would argue that imaging is not very relevant for these patients. You're embarking on a course of therapy. You're going to give them the six doses of radium as long as they tolerate it. And do you even need to image the extent of disease? Now, me personally, I feel that it's important for the understanding of how the therapy works and how to make it better in the future for us to image at the same time so that we can start to pair the two together, the imaging and the therapy, as we look forward to other uh, models in the future. And then finally, there's a need for predictive um, as well as prognostic biomarkers. So it's good to know who has a higher likelihood of response and who has a higher likelihood of progressing while on a particular therapy, but it would be nice to have an imaging biomarker that would actually stratify to tell us things like this patient would be better suited to radium-223 as opposed to this patient who would be better treated with docetaxel. That's a predictive marker that allows you to actually intervene early and direct patients to appropriate therapy. And that's what we're missing at this point with radium therapy as well as other types of cancer therapies is imaging that will actually guide us to the appropriate management for a particular patient. So with that, I will finish up my presentation. I'm very optimistic for the use of radium-223. I think it will continue to be refined going forward. And as we get the answers to some of these questions, I think it's going to be even better employed for patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate carcinoma, as well as other malignancies going forward, Um, other tumors that also go to bone, including primary bone-forming tumors like osteosarcoma. I think there's tremendous potential for the future.